Welcome to the Forging Honor Podcast. I'm Jonathan George. And I'm Benjamin Jones. Here at The Forge, we explore what it means to live as Christian men. Along the way, we'll be doing weekly challenges to build character through action. We are by no means experts, just two young Christian men trying to make sense of a wild world. That's right. We're doing our best to learn and hope you'll join us on the journey. If you want to get directly involved, go to ForgingHonor.com to find information on how to join our community. This is episode 14. I have some notes. That that title banjo is uh, gonna throw some folks for a loop. <laughs> Myself, <laughs> um, at any rate, challenge wrap up time for this. Uh, I guess fortnightly forging honor. Um, I haven't used the word fortnightly like that before. That might be the first time I've used it appropriately. Um, mm, I, I, yeah, I don't know if that's quite right. Well, anyway, fortnightly is two every two weeks, right? Oh, if you, oh, I thought you meant because it was 14 episodes, but you're right. No, right? no, you, no, you're right. It is. Yeah. All right, every two bad. weeks. It's a fortnightly release. I, it is a fortnightly release. You're right. I rescind anyway, my, okay. I rescind uh, my edit. Sorry, listener. Um, challenges last for 10 days. That's Monday through Friday for two weeks. They are simple daily tasks to grow us as men. Um, this previous challenge was simply to journal at the end of each day, uh, for 20 minutes, we, we specified a time. Um, and, and we focused that journal on, uh, certain types of questions about how the day went and, and then what we could do better the next day. So I only got six of the 10 days and Banjo got eight of the 10 days. Uh, so kudos to you, Banjo, for being an overachiever. Well, that's not really you, to, the, oh, there's no way to overachieve on this. You either hit ten or you don't. You know, um, if I hit fourteen, that might do it. But if yeah, if we recorded that, but we don't. No, um, no. At any rate, I really appreciated this challenge. I really enjoyed it. I felt like uh, it was really good for me. Um, what was your experience like, Banjo? What did? Um, what did you journal on and kind of what, what was your process? Yeah. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed this one and I appreciated you, uh, you know, making the laying the challenge down, so to speak. Um, I, I really liked the questions and the, and the idea of this is, you know, what did I do? Well, what did, what do I need to improve on? Um, what didn't I do? Well, that kind of thing. I really liked those questions and it was pretty helpful for me. Um, one of the things that I think surprised me was um, when I when I've tried to do journaling nightly in the past, I've often felt like oh, I got it. Like this is another thing that I got to add on to it. Uh, like I just want to go to bed. Um, and really, with this challenge, I really appreciated the chance to look back over the day and to think about it and to process it. Um, and so this, I don't know if it was the particular set of questions or maybe it was the time spent or or well, what. But what kind of what kind of questions are you asking yourself? Well, I interrupted you, but well, you know, a it's, good, it's a good question. Um, no, no, no. I just the questions that you had recommended we ask the um, the what what did I do well today? Um, what didn't I do well today? How can I improve um, tomorrow? You know, and looking at those, I think the questions that I was additionally asking myself were. Things like, um, you know, was I, was I Christ-like in my relations to my wife today? You know, did I, am I laying down my life uh, in a good way? Um, am, am I following out the scriptures um, in these different areas? Um, another one I was asking myself was, am I, am I doing the things I say I want to do? Um, so. One of the things is um, I'm I have different writing projects, and part of part of what I want to do is to send these writing projects out to folks so that they can maybe one day, Lord willing, get published. And um, I've been saying I want to do that for a long time, and like send send some of these notes out. And, and after journaling this week, I was like, No, I got to start doing this. Like I can't just say I'm going to do it. I got to actually start doing the process. Um, so I felt like the journaling led to action and I really appreciated that. But what was your I, experience I, like? Well, I, 
similar to with the with the journaling leading to action. Um, I wasn't asking exactly the same questions as you, but one thing that I started doing with mine was uh, kind of at the end after I worked through some of these questions, setting some goals, um, and I found myself one I was writing the same goals most evenings because you know, the span of a week, like you might have a goal for the next day. Like if you have a big thing to do or, or a big project, but most of my goals typically need a few days to be accomplished. Um, which means yeah. if I'm going to work on them, I have to constantly remind myself of that. And the main thing was, I think I, I'd appreciated about doing that, working through those questions. Um, and then doing that right before bed was I woke up thinking about it. I woke up going, man, I said I was going to do X, Y, and Z. And I said, I didn't do this thing well yesterday. I want to do this other thing well today. Um, that was really impactful for me. Um, uh, that I noticed a distinct difference in my days following a day of journaling or following a, a night, a, a journaling evening versus the days where I did not journal over these two weeks. Yeah. Uh, when I tell you, I noticed the difference, like it was, it was night and day, like, so, mm. um, uh, wasting time on my phone mm. being on, on YouTube or something. I had that same one. The days, the days that I, the days where I had journaled the night before, like it was basically zero. I mean, yeah, it was, it was shocking the difference that and I just didn't even want to grab my phone because I was motivated to go get the stuff done that I had said I would do. And I felt like, I don't know if you felt this way, but I felt like the day that I wrote that down in the journal of, oh man, I'm spending a lot of time on YouTube. It was like, well, the the thing that made me aware of it, you know, I feel aware of it in the moment, but when I'm looking back over my day, I mean, like, what did I accomplish today? What did I think about today? It's like, oh, I spent way too long on YouTube. Like, I'm not going right. to write, I don't want to write that down. I don't want to be. Well, it, it forces guy. you to kind of confront that. It's also nice because you get to see the little victories you make when you do accomplish yeah. a goal that you set. And that's so satisfying because you said, oh, I wrote this thing down that I want to improve on. So one thing, another thing I realized was, um, I'm looking back over my journals. It's remarkable how quickly you forget some of this stuff, mm -hmm. actually. You're like, oh, I wrote that down. Um, but I had some, I had set some goals towards spending better time with my son. Just, that was one of the things I felt like I could improve on um, just because I had not responded well uh, during the day that day when um, he'd come into my office and, you know, he wants to play. He's, he's just over a year old. Right. Yeah. Um, and I was like, you know, I didn't snap at him or anything, but I kind of blew him off. Just ignored him. I didn't right. give him even a moment of full attention just to say, Hey son, you know, I love you. Now I do have to do work. But I just kind of, you know, pushed him away. And I remember thinking back to that going, that's not the greatest thing. Like he, because what he sees is he sees his dad looking at a screen. You know, I work from home on a computer. Mm -hmm. So he sees his dad looking at a screen and shoving him away. Yeah. Right. He doesn't see his dad moving his attention from the screen to his, to him, you know, his getting that full attention of his father, even for just, you know, a couple of seconds. And then being able, then his dad being able to go back to do his work. Right. And I, I, yeah. I don't know, that was something that I really felt like that was good. So I realized the next day, you know, I worked through, how did I do on that? Cause he always wants to come say, Hey, Oh, I, you know, I, I think I did better. Cause I can remember distinct moments of, yeah, pick up my son say, Hey, I love you. And then, all right, now he's happy. He'll go around his way. All he wanted was a hug or something, you know? Yeah. He wanted that attention. Exactly. Yeah. So With that, that was helpful for me. Yeah, with that, do you do you feel like one thing I noticed for myself with journaling, like you know, we kind of talked about how there's when you have the same goal, you know, over two weeks and you don't necessarily see huge improvement over that, you know, over those two weeks. Did you feel like you had place in your journal? I didn't really think about this until just now, but did you have a place in your journal for grace? That makes sense, like. Not not just like oh well, not grace in the sense of like oh well I you know I di I didn't it's okay that I didn't do this because da 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 da, da um, making excuses but more grace in the sense of like you know I know I didn't hit this mark that I was aiming for today but God's grace is sufficient for me in this way because I feel like is when you have that when you have a journal and you have this kind of record of 
what you did well, what you didn't do well. For me, looking at that record, it was like, I mean, it's, it, it felt like a tablet, like it was carved into stone. Um, and I often, I think, came away with like, well, I have to do better. And I must do, like, I must be better. Um, and, and which could, sometimes it would slip into this kind of like, I need to work harder. I need to put my righteousness into work. But how do you think, is there a way to, to do journaling what does it look like to do journaling with grace? It's an interesting question that I also had not really considered until now. I, I'll tell you this. Thinking through the prax, practicing of, of the journal, that process, there's a reason I said the what questions and not why questions. You know, don't ever, you don't start off by asking, why did I not do well today? Right? That mm. has an immediate assumption mm. that you're not doing well, that you're not, Right. Um, you don't ask why did that go wrong, right? Why did why did this thing at work go so terribly or whatever it was? Um, in the same sense, you don't ask why why am I so great at you know who I am? You know that that's just mm. why questions are not productive in that way. And I think it's built into the form of the what question to allow yourself a little bit of that room. Um, because if you ask what did I do well today, it assumes one there is a standard, but it also you know the next question what did I not do well. That assumes you're not, there's something you're not doing well, but it also means you can change, right? Like, I, I think, I think the what questions help with that. Hmm. Um, on, on that note as well, it's, it's the, the fact that you are working through these goals and these ideas, you're able to see that's something maybe that you did not do well, or you did do well. That's a direct reflection. It gives you something to work through. Um, and I think, I think it's not a bad thing that that drives you to action. I do think you have to recognize, oh, maybe I, I set a goal that was too lofty, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there was one day where I go, I have this goal. Um, I ha had, had a long-term work goal. But I knew like, there's no way I could achieve it in the next 24 hours, right? right. You know, it's going to take some study and some time. So I kind of laid out a, an idea of over the next month or two, here's what I want to accomplish. And so now that's there. That's just sitting there and you know I've, I've flipped back to it and taken a look at it and written out little pieces of how i've done with that um but i think right a goal is just it's just a goal it's not it's not sinning to not achieve your goal it's what would be sin is if i went out and swore on 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 the, on the bible that i'm going to accomplish this thing right i'm not i'm not doing that i'm saying i am setting out to achieve this goal by god's by god's grace and power i, I think i can do it um, yeah, I I don't know. I so I think I think that's not necessarily a complete answer. I guess what I would say is I don't necessarily feel the need to say quote unquote give myself grace on something that one is an immoral requirement anyway, and two it's already built in that it, it's assumed I'm going to fail at certain things. Does that make well, sense? Well, so I think. So that was convoluted, but well, well, I'm so maybe I should clarify my question too. Because I'm not so much thinking of giving my giving myself grace, I guess I don't think, um, in the sense of like, well, I didn't accomplish the task that I set out, right? You know, I didn't I didn't build the table that I wanted to, but more. Did you try to build a table, Banjo? No, I didn't try to build. A table. <laughs> because I will become a woodworker now. <laughs> I'm gonna be a word. I'm gonna be a woodman in four days. No, um, but more like. You know, and this journal things. worked really well for you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you what. He learned an entirely new skill he never tried. I'm a whole new man. Um, hey, I'm looking at like a, a beard and flannel banjo. <laughs> <laughs> You're just over here. Lumberjack Jones, they call me. Um, you know, <laughs> but but more like, you know, like I kept thinking of, man, I, uh, I'm really impatient. You know, I kept seeing the ways that I'm an impatient person. And at the end of the day, I'd be like, well, I want to be better at being patient. And then the mm. next day I would be like, but I'm not patient. Like I still am right. constantly failing at being patient. And so, you know, I, I can't give myself grace for that, mm. but I need to mm. rely on the Lord's grace for that. Um, so something that is more of a moral failing I mean, right. in a sense, in, in patience know. is grows into much. I, I see what you're saying. I think, in, in that sense, turn to scripture, right? Don't turn to your yeah. 
your journal because like you just said, it's not on you to give yourself grace. You can, right. you can work through why you might not have achieved a goal that you set, why you didn't accomplish some deadline, right? You can work through that. Yeah. Um, and that's in some sense, I mean, that's just part of life, but yeah, working through your moral failings. If you're noting that regularly in your journal, turn to scripture, don't turn back to your journal, right? right. Don't turn inward. Yeah. Um, the, the, the purpose of the journal in my mind is look at what happened during the day in the previous 24 hours or maybe over the last week, if there's been some kind of long-term thing, look at how can your actions, what actions can you specifically take? That's the only inward part of this, right? Assessing your abilities, assessing your, the, what you have to offer on this, right? Yeah. Because, you know, Banjo is looking at a different set of skills and abilities in his journal than JJ is. But yeah. they're both working towards the same aim, right? And that's godliness, right? Yeah. So you, you, you only are looking at yourself for as long as, as it takes to assess what you have to offer, which isn't much. That's, that's another part of this is you realize pretty quickly, there's not much I have to offer um, relative in any moral sense or even in a, a worldly right. sense, right? You, you quickly realize I am but a man. Yeah. But what can I do with that? And what has the Lord granted to me in that? Yeah. Yeah. And with that, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about this week is as I continued my nerddom studies through Kierkegaard, um, I, I read Fear and Trembling, um, which is his treatise on, by the way, I, I feel a deep need to give an apology to all of our listeners because I think last episode I said that the quote subjectivity or truth is subjectivity, I think I said, was from fear and trembling. It's not. Um, it's from, um, I believe, concluding thoughts on the unscientific postscript. So uh, disclaimer. It's still Kierkegaard though, right? So it is still Kierkegaard. Okay, yeah, okay. That's right. But the book was wrong. My conscience weighed me. Um, he got that in his journaling. That was his goal. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, that was the one I couldn't shake. That was the one I needed grace for. Um, no, it was moral failing. He <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, uh, in, in fear and trembling, one of the things that he's talking about is, um, the issue of, as this comes up in sickness unto death too, some, but, um, the issue of, um, the, in, uh, there's, we have this concept of, of universals of these are always the right things to do. Um, but in, in, for individuals, there's different ways that this plays out. Um, and there isn't a cookie cutter way to live. Um, there isn't a, a, a cookie cutter life, um, so to speak. Um, so, you know, we can't, we can't say that the way to live life is if you do this thing, and then if you do this thing, and then if you do this thing, then you're good. You know, everyone has to, as, as the Bible says, work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Um, and the example he uses, which is a fascinating example that I really hadn't given enough time and thought to, the example that he gives is Abraham and Isaac, um, where Abraham is told he must sacrifice his son. And uh, there's a whole, I mean, the whole book is just kind of working through what does that mean? But if you think about it, you know, what Abraham is being asked to do there in, in a sacrifice of Isaac, he's is essentially being asked to murder his son. He's being told, commanded to murder his son, as far as he understands it. He knows that's not what is going to happen. You know, he believes that God wouldn't have him murder his own son. And even if he would murder his own son, then somehow God would bring him back from the dead. Um, you know, because he has that kind of a faith in God. It's interesting, uh, though, because that's that, that piece of the story isn't actually revealed until much later in Scripture. Like, that's something that right. we aren't and, told in, in the moment of the story. It's like, wait, he's just going to go through with this? But Abraham doesn't know it either. You know, exactly. Abraham's going through and he doesn't tell anyone either. You know, um, and when Isaac asks, what, you know, we don't have a lamb, what are we going to do? Um, and Abraham says, God will provide, you know, it's a statement of faith. Um, and he, but he doesn't tell Isaac what the plan is, what God has told him. Um, and so one of Kierkegaard's points is, hey, from a, from a standard perspective, from a basic perspective, what Abraham did was wrong. Like, he was told to go murder his son. He went up the mountain with intention to murder his son. Um, 
and he didn't tell anybody. Um, but Abraham That's wasn't an old man takes son of mountain. <laughs> right. right. But that's not what Abraham was doing is Kierkegaard's point. He says, this is not, you know, he wasn't going to do that. He was acting in faith. He was going to sacrifice his son. It was a moral obligation to God. But, but part of his point is, um, part of Kierkegaard's point is, you know, that passage is often taught as, well, Abraham is a great man because he was willing to sacrifice the very best for, for God. Um, and Kierkegaard says, this is a terrible sermon to preach from this passage because if that's what we that's what we preach, then what we're going to end up with is a whole bunch of parents going out after the Sunday service, murdering their children. Um, you know, this is this because they'll be sacrificing their best, right? It's um, true, and in a way, they. I mean, side note here: in a way, you see some parents do that, not in a literal physical sense, but in a sense of they sacrifice their children to the aims of their society or the aims of, sure. of I mean, even in, in church, you'll see parents that are, uh, how, how do I put this without, um, offending a whole lot of people. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's <laughs> the parents that sacrifice kind of the, their individual child for the sake of the, the, the universal church, if that makes mm. sense. Individual it, child. Oh, it, okay. Yeah, let yeah. Me, yeah. I, and I'm let, me kinda, with you. let me tease that out a little bit because in Christianity, there's the tension. It's good. There's the tension between the individual is very important, right? The individual, it's essential. It's very essential. Um, and yet the whole body of the church is also very emphasized, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's neither individualism. Nor is it collectivism. Um, collectivism, correct. And I think a lot of, at least in the West, it's easy for folks to swing way one way or way the other when it comes to Christianity. And you see parents do both of those things. Um, and you see, I mean, you see children, I think maybe it's more the, the rebellious spirit of, of children to go the direction of the individual. And you see that still, like that's, that's very common. Um, and, and especially some, I, I mean, I'm in a very conservative church, but in the more conservative churches, the individual is, is a lot of above all else because, and I think for good reason, because the, as the collectivist mindset has kind of overtaken society for the last decade or so, um, which I don't, I don't know if folks realize that that's happening. Well, it's, but on it's the weird people act like they're individuals, but on the other hand, they become collectivists and it's the weirdest thing on the other hand. I, I agree with you, but I think if in some collectivist churches, or not, sorry, not collectivist churches, in some conservative churches, mm. there is a, there is a temptation to not understand all people as individuals. Um, right. They're all, we can just put, put enough gospel on this and then that person is fine, you know? Well, not, not, it's not quite, a, I can see what you're saying, but I'm thinking of families where um, you know, uh, where, where male headship verges on cult-like power, right? Where, right. The, where the man is the head of the household to the point that every decision that is made must be made by the man. Um, and, right. and then all children and women lose all sense of individuality, right? They, their personhood is, is lost in the man. Um, and, uh, you know, it's possible to do it the other way too. Right. But, um, it's, or the churches, there are churches out there where it's, you know, it's not, it's not about the gospel according to Christ, but the gospel according to this pastor. Right. Um, and if you're going to be, if you're going to be a believer and if you're, and again, I think this is where you're, where you're spot on. If your children is going to, if your children are going to be saved, you must do this, right? You have to send them to this school. Um, you have to buy yeah, this I've seen that. curriculum. You need to wear these clothes, right? And if you don't, then your kid is in jeopardy, right? Well, and, or, or the parents also, and the parents will honestly feel that way. Oh, I should put my kid at a Christian school or else they're yeah. going to turn out bad. 
Right. What's shocking is, is um, if you look at statistics across the nation, uh, children coming out of Christian schools are no better or worse when it comes to major markers such as divorce rate. Yeah. Kids that went to Christian school have the same divorce rate as, as um, dare I say, pagans that went to pagan schools. Uh, <laughs> but I think this is where your, your point is well taken because one of the things that, you know, uh, both of those groups can miss is what is, what is one of the things that's required of a Christian faith is, is individuality in the sense of the individual in Christianity is the one who stands in relation to God, right? The individual has the faith. Right. It's not, you know, you do not have the faith for your son. I do not have the faith for my wife. Or those, they, those choices have to be made individual to those people. Exactly. When I, when I left for college, my dad had me copy, I think it was the Westminster Confession, and he wrote a note in there saying, make your faith your own, right? Yeah. Your, yeah. Your faith, you've been in my household up until this point, and you've been able to rely on me, your father, to ensure that you're in church on Sundays and you're, you're doing the, the, the outward appearances of, of scripture anyway. Right. But at a certain point, if you don't, if you don't put this inside, you know, it's, you're going to college, you're going to be able to do what you want. You might not, you got to, you got to get it inside of you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Make, making your faith your own. That's the individual. That makes sense. But at the same time, we, how do we learn who we are as individuals? We learn who we are as individuals by being in relation to other people. Right. The whole, right. We, we, require, we require that community. The whole point of this podcast is that you and I get to know who we are better by getting to know the other person better. Mm. Right. Um, I think, I think it was Lewis talks about, you know, when I can't remember which one of the Inklings passed away, uh, one of the Inklings passed away and C.S. Lewis said something to another one of the Inklings, something along the lines of, you know, um, I, I'm really sad because I'm, I'm never going to get to know you, um, the same way again, because this other person is dead, right? This, this person who had passed away brought some brought something out of this other inkling um, that C.S. Lewis couldn't bring out of this other inkling, right? And so C.S. Lewis, in, in the relationship of the three of them, all three needed to be present um, to bring out something whole. Um, and so in the same way, you know, we get, we get to know each other better through other people, um, but we, we can't live our lives through other people. And this is what I think, you know, the journaling exercise is so helpful because if there's if there's one thing that we're missing in modern life, it's a sense of self reflection on our soul. You know, well, we we have a false sense of that. We self identify yeah. exactly. Right? But, 100%. but yep. the, the difference there is, you know, you use the word self reflection to self identify is to say I am this. I am right? with those people. Right. Um. I'm part of this group that makes me special in who I am. Yeah. And I think that's, again, one of the reasons I like the what question so much. I think I heard that I, maybe it was an art of manliness podcast. So I, I think so. Remember. I can't, I think I heard that one too somewhere. If, if someone listens, someone other than us listens to art of manliness and knows what episode we're talking about, uh, please send it to me. I want to link it in the show notes or in the discord or something. Um, but the thing I loved so much about the what question, right? It doesn't focus on anything beyond my actions, right? Mm. It doesn't say, I mean, it can focus on, on, I guess, how my, our internal actions, maybe our reactions to something in the sense of my, my emotional reaction to, uh, my child coming up to me while I'm at work, but, um, it, it doesn't focus on why am I the way that I am? Right? It doesn't focus on me in, in this existential sense. It focuses on what can I do to improve. Does that make sense? Sort of, but uh, I... Mm. It, just, it just phrases the question a little bit differently. It's not like, it's not end all be all. It's just it's yeah. enough of a, of a phrase change, I think. But I, but I think what I disagree on, and this may just be a personal preference, but I like the existential questions. That's, Time and place for that. That's what I love. So, there is a- so I'm, I, I'm my current obsession... Um, cause you know, every podcast I have a new obsession. 
Um, but my current, that. yeah, it's been every every two weeks. Ben every two finds weeks. some new hobby, a new book to to back it up. Sticking with the theme, um, I mean that's what we do here. Honestly. That's what we. Uh, yes, this is the uh, this is the Ben Jones Obsession Podcast, um, co-hosted by a very patient man who's willing to put up with it. I enjoy uh, it. I enjoy it. <laughs> Don't flatter this, yourself too much, though. That's right. That's right. Uh, no, um, this this week's obsession is Hamlet. So I have been uh, is a brilliant. Uh, london production of of hamlet that's have you heard of this guy called shakespeare i mean (laughs) he's incredible (laughs) wrote this wrote this play like hamlet pretty similar to the lion king or not kind of underground (laughs) yeah it's it's kind of like very niche thing yeah 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 nobody's ever heard of it i'm the first anyway um no i i uh i've long been obsessed with hamlet um but but i've uh gotten the chance to kind of rewatch some of it this week. And one of the things that just stands out, I think immediately on watching Hamlet or reading Hamlet is how many soliloquies there are. And, um, define that for, uh, the audience. Ah, uh, yes. For the audience, uh, for, for the audience and not for JJ soliloquy is, um, when the, uh, a character is alone on stage and they address the audience, um, and so they give a, a long little, speech. Yeah. One of those speeches where they kind of turn aside and they're. Yeah. Usually yeah, yeah. they're alone on stage. Um, gotcha. And so, but it's a, it, it's typically a moment in the play where we're getting to see the character's thoughts. Um, so right, like the whole to be or not to be speech would be a soliloquy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay. See, um, I, I know what you're talking about. I just, I just didn't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yes. Um, so at Hamlet, it, it, the play, the play Hamlet is obsessed with soliloquy. Um, kind of obsessed with this idea that we can, in theater, we can we can get this glimpse into a character's mind um, and see why they're making the decisions that they're making. Um, and Hamlet is a play all about decisions um, and indecision. Um, a lot of people believe that Hamlet's tragic flaw is that he chooses not to um, kill his uncle Claudius when he has the chance. You could debate that, but you know that's not the point of this podcast. Um, but really what's interesting in Hamlet is to, is to watch Hamlet's mental journey and to see the decisions that he makes and to see the reasons that he gives. And one of the things that I've been thinking about with journaling, you know, and he, he develops this kind of incredible sense of the self within that play. Um, and I, part of the, the lastingness of the play, part of the reason it's, it's carried on for so long um, and has had such an impression on the human race, I think, is because it beautifully captures that feeling of being a self trapped in a broken world. Um, I mean, that's what Hamlet's all about. It's just a, a soul confronted with sin who's trying to figure out what it means to escape. Um, and and really, that's where the to be or not to be question comes in. Because if if sin is in the world, if, if life is broken, um, why, why do we stick around? And Hamlet's trying to figure out the answer to that question. And I think the play is actually much more optimistic than most people think, but that's my, that's for, again, a different podcast. So anyway, you were going to say something. Oh, I was going to say something. Sorry. Um, so anyway, the, uh, it strikes me that journaling is an opportunity for us to soliloquy a little bit, you know, it's, okay. it, it's a little bit, see, there was a point to that long setup. Um, I, I was like, where is this going? Yeah. Uh, I was just thinking, you know, there's a chance for us as we journal to get this look into our brains and to say, okay, this is, this is who I think I am, right? This is who I think scripture says that I am. This is, um, who, uh, I, I think God has made me to be. Um, and this is why I'm making the choices that I make. Right. And there's that why question. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I want to push back on that a little bit. Push. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say. I won't say there's never a time and place for those, those why questions and those kind of that more inward existential focus, those to be or not to be questions. Though if you're dealing with that question, talk to someone. Um, (laughs) So when it comes to those existential questions and self-focus, one thing um, I've heard recently, and I think this is a Jordan Peterson thing, which love him or hate him. He's a good psychologist. 
um, he was he was saying in in the world he's in anyway in the, the psychological literature right. um, to focus on oneself uh, is the same as uh, how how do you put it I think it was um, misery self hatred the more you focus on yourself the more miserable you become in the clinical literature and uh he he equates that to you know when you're when you're focusing on yourself and you notice more about who you are as an individual um it's the same as if someone pointed out and said haha that's embarrassing look at them look at that thing about right but you're doing it to yourself so it's all the worse um, yeah so there's but again at the same time you know even though that's the case like there is there's a sense and he, he even advises young men to journal yeah so i i don't think i don't think he means don't ask those existential questions because then you'll be miserable but i think he means too much of that and too much of the um that intense focus putting yourself under the microscope like that um can produce that self-loathing unless and i'm gonna this is my unless not not to remove this my unless is unless you can refocus that somewhere else and this this is i think is very important this is why it goes back to earlier we turn to scripture so yeah when we focus on ourselves right we see our self-loathing we see ourselves we see our we see our sin and that's good insofar as it allows us to identify that we are that we need christ and that we can improve, right? As we ask these questions for ourselves in our, in, in our journals, we can say, we can track the progress of we are improving, right? We're not perfect, we are sinners, but we are being sanctified. We can see that progress and that's a glorious, beautiful thing, right? We get to we yeah. get to focus on Christ rather than ourselves. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? I don't, I get to look at a perfect thing rather than at myself and I get to try to be more like that perfect thing. Yeah. And then when I look back at myself, I shouldn't say, wow, look, I'm not perfect. I can say, looking through my journal, look how far I've come and look how much further I get to go. Yeah. So that's, it's really interesting you say that because that's essentially what Kierkegaard says with, with some twists. Kierkegaard says come this, full circle. Yep. 1849, the sickness unto death, read it. Um, it's really good. Um, but in the sickness unto death, Kierkegaard says that uh, a self, self, when one attains self-consciousness, when we become aware of ourself, um, we naturally become, we fall into despair because automatically we know that we fall short of See, God's glory. Not a new thing. Not, not a new thing. thing at all. So he says, when we become aware of ourselves, we fall into despair. And he says, this is good um, because he says, if we fall into despair, then we go to God. We have to be in despair to go to God. If we are not in despair, we won't go to God. Because if we are not in despair about ourselves, we think I can fix this. I can get out of this. I can do this, but we can't, and we have to go to God and those things. And so he says, the more that we attain self-conscious, you know, the more aware we are of ourselves, the deeper we get to know ourselves, um, the deeper our need for Christ, and the deeper our despair. Um, so he says, you know, the more that we journal, the more that we study who we are, the better we get to know ourselves. The more we're going to find sin, the more we're going to find brokenness. Um, and even as we improve in those things, we're going to say, well, yeah, I've improved in this, but now I've realized that I had this other sin that I never even realized, mm. you know? Right, um, right. And so the, That's the way it goes. It's the most annoying thing, man. Yeah. It's like, but, every time I'm like, what? I didn't know I had this problem. Right. Anyway, but it's that sanctification, you know, that's yeah, true. That's what we believe is this is what's necessary. And so um, it's not that we should live in despair and go, Oh, I'm I'm so sad all the time because I have this sin, um, but but instead, um, you know, combine this with with what Kierkegaard says in Fear and Trembling, where he says, you know, essentially to be what he calls a knight of faith is to believe the absurd, um, and in this case, the absurd is how could anyone as sinful as me be saved, right? Um, how could anyone with with what I have on my conscience be saved? Um, and Kierkegaard says, you can't except for Christ and you have to right. believe that. Um, well, and again, that's an individual choice, an individual belief by the grace of God. Here, here's the catch there. 
if you focus on yourself and you're in despair and you don't have scripture to go to, you don't have Christ to go to, the only thing you can do is continue to dwell on your despair and begin to self-identify with that despair. Exactly. Begin to identify with your sin. So it is therefore just absolutely, I mean, imperative, absolutely like the most important thing on the planet, can't ever emphasize this, to be in scripture, to be leaning on Christ. Because otherwise, when in those moments of despair and in that journaling, when you do go to the existential questions, I think I'm coming around to why I would ask myself those questions. It is so important that you have a Bible ready to go. I mean, it just, yeah, you have, and, you have scripture memorized, whatever it is, because if you don't like what, what else can you do? Well, what I started doing is, and I think you're right. What I started doing is I started doing like a prayer journal. So I would, I would write out what I did well, what I didn't do well, what I wanted to improve. And then under that category, I would pray about, I would write out a prayer about, you know, this is what I need to, to work on today, and this is what I want to work on tomorrow, and God help me to do these things. And I, it was a really good practice. I that's, really that's, enjoyed that. That sounds really good. I should start doing that. Yeah, I, and I think it'll be um, – I think it's something I want to keep doing. Um, Flannery O'Connor has some great prayer journals. If you've never read Flannery O'Connor's prayer journal, do yourself a favor and pick it up because it's some good stuff. She's also hilarious. Um, but but I think it'll be good to kind of look over it and see these these prayers that the Lord has answered um, in some cool ways. So that's really good. Yeah, I definitely I want to keep up this habit. I think that's the question um, that I'm not sure if we've asked ourselves that at the end of every episode, but I know that's one we we intend to ask ourselves. Definitely a habit to continue, in my opinion. I don't yeah. know if the full 20 minutes. Um, is is achievable. I think that that was one of the limiting things for me. Um, but still taking the time, whether it's, it's five, 10 minutes, setting aside that moment at the end of the day, to ask yourself a set of questions. I like the prayer journal idea a lot. I think I'm going to try that. Um, setting some goals, whatever it is that works for you. Um, so we can continue to grow as men. All right. The next challenge, well, let me first review. We have challenges last for 10 days. Uh, it's Monday through Friday for two weeks. They're simple daily tasks to grow us as men. And this next challenge um, is being presented to us by our very own Banjo. So, Yes. Well, uh, I, I came to JJ this week and uh, I, I said, look, I in have tears. Some, in tears. I said, I said, I'm in mourning. I wasn't really in tears, but I was, I was a little depressed. Um, for those of you who are in the literary world, um, you may, may already know, uh, the acclaimed author Cormac McCarthy passed away, uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, and, uh, he was a literary, uh, giant, um, in the American scene, probably, you know, many consider him to be the greatest, uh, greatest American writer in the last, you know, basically since Hemingway, um, since Faulkner. Um, he's, he's just an incredible writer. He's written many books, um, and really changed the landscape of, of writing and is, is going to have a really big impact on, um, literature and, and, um, and, and American literature for the next, you know, people are saying 200 years. I mean, he's, he's really good. Um, and, uh, he's an, he's an incredible writer. He's one of my favorites. I've been uh, doing some, I've been studying him for a little bit now, uh, just the last few months trying to get a handle on some of his books and uh he's written some he's let me put it this way he's often known um for writing very masculine books um and uh a lot of literary critics judge him for that but i think we can celebrate him a little bit for that um because there's some really just incredible things that he's written about what it means to be a man um and uh what does it look like uh and and Really, even even though his characters are often male, his stories are often very uh, masculine. We could say he's really not writing about men so much as he's writing about the human spirit, um, and uh, writing about uh, deeply flawed characters in a deeply broken world, um, and trying to see if we can still make some hope out of that. Um, so, my challenge uh, that I would like to present to the group 
um, is to read a Cormac McCarthy book uh, in these next two weeks, um, or at least start one. Um, we got 10 days for the challenge. Um, and so the goal would just be read a little bit each day. Uh, I don't even think, maybe read five minutes, 10 minutes if you can. Um, he doesn't write very long books. No, as long as you're not picking up. Pretty easily, in my opinion. Yeah, as long as you're not picking up like Suchry. You know, I think that's his longest one at like 500 pages. Um, okay. every, everything else he writes, he should be able to finish in two weeks, I think, yeah. probably. Um, let, me, let me give some advice on this. If you've never read Cormac McCarthy, um, if you've never read Cormac McCarthy, if this is your first time hearing his name, let me just give some warnings right now. His books are dark, um, often extremely violent, um, and they're, they're textually uh, difficult um, in that he, he does a particular thing with his style. I mean, as soon as you open up a Cormac McCarthy book, you know it because the page looks different than any other book you've ever read. He doesn't use punctuation marks hardly at all. He uses periods and he uses the occasional comma, um, but that's pretty much it. The commas are actually jarring after you've been going through for a long time and suddenly there's a yeah. comma and you're like, where did that come from? Yeah, you will never see a semicolon. I'll tell you that right now. Um, you also won't see quotation marks um, and, uh, and anything like that. So, um, and I know for, for folks who are like, who think reading a book is hard enough, I understand. Uh, but trust me, you get used to it. It's not quite as hard as it sounds. You just kind of fall into it after a little while. Um, but it is tough. Uh, and so uh, if you've never read Cormac McCarthy before, um, let me recommend um, first The Road, um, which is his most popular uh, novel by far. Um, Oprah loved it. So if Oprah loved it, you can too. Um, oh my. I, I'll tell you though, uh, I loved The Road. That's the only Cormac McCarthy one I have read. But in my opinion, men with sons should read The Road. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Like, yeah, abs absolutely. It's all about um, the love of a father and a son. It's a, it's a really sweet story. Um, have a box of tissues. Actually, it's one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite Art of Manliness uh, episodes. It involves The Road. So you can listen to that as well. Maybe we can link that in the show notes for this week. Um, and uh, again, if you haven't read it, if you haven't read Cormac McCarthy, um, the other one I would recommend is All the Pretty Horses. Um, it's uh, the beginning of a, of a three-part series um, called The Border Trilogy, um, following a young boy who goes on an adventure in Mexico. Um, it's another one of his really popular books, um, but it gives you a really good taste of um, his writing, and um, it's a really exciting story. Um, I really love it. It's one of my favorites. Um, so if you've never read Cormac, I would start with those. If you have read McCarthy before and you're up for a challenge, and I mean like a really big challenge, but you've, if you've read The Road, if you've read All the Pretty Horses, um, but, you've, but you've never read anything else, if you want to go off the deep end, try Blood Meridian. Um, Blood Meridian, um, it's called, or The Evening Redness in the West, is extremely dark, not for the faint of heart, um, or the, or yeah, anyone who doesn't like blood. Um, but if you, if you can handle it, try it. It is well, well worth it. Um, and it's one of my, it's probably my favorite McCarthy book. Um, I'm going to see if I can get my hands on some other ones. I'm going to be reading The Crossing, um, which is the second in the Border Trilogy. Um, but really any, any Cormac you can find. Um, oh, No Country for Old Men. Read that I one. I was going to say, I think I think that's the one I might go for because I, I saw the movie of that before I even knew who Cormac McCarthy was, um, and I, I I need to read it. Yeah, excellent. Um, and the movie's great too. Uh, if you are reading another book and you want to find, if you want to watch that movie uh, in preparation, go for it because it's a it's a great movie uh, and does a really good job of adapting the book. Anyway, so read Cormac McCarthy. That's the challenge. Very good. This has been the Forging Honor Podcast. The music and production is by Elliot George. For more information about what we do or to learn how to get involved, visit our website at forginghonor.com. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to like, subscribe, and give us a rating to bring others into the Forging Honor journey.
On our website, you'll find information on how to do the challenges alongside us, as well as links to the many resources we mentioned in the show. And we do make a small amount from any purchases you make through our website links, so thank you in advance. Thanks for taking time with us today. We hope you'll take up the work alongside us and join us in the task of forging honor. We'll see you next time.